Hereby, I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. First of all, I welcome Mrs. Daniela Rodriguez, and she will defend in public her thesis, Gut Feelings, towards a better understanding of the transcriptomic and molecular signatures of drug-induced intestinal toxi toxicity in human 3D organoids. Uh, I welcome all members of the degree committee, and in particular the two supervisors, Professor uh, Theo de Kok, he is Professor of Population-Based Toxicogenomics at Maastricht University, and Dr. Daniel Jennen, he is um, Associate Professor in Bioinformatics also at Maastricht University. And I will introduce the other members of the committee, and in particular the opponents later during the ceremony. Um, welcome to you here in the aula, and I also welcome all the followers of the live stream. May I invite you to present a summary of your thesis? Please go ahead. Thank you. So dear Prorector, members of the Corona, colleagues, friends, and family, thank you for being here today for the presentation of my thesis entitled Gut Feelings Towards a Better Understanding of the Transcriptomic and Molecular Signatures of Drug-Induced Intestinal Toxicity in Human 3D Organisms. I will first introduce the topic and then go through the different chapters of my thesis. Starting by describing what toxicology is, the scientific field mainly investigates those response relationships, aiming to determine the therapeutic or harmful concentrations of compounds. Advances in toxicology were possible due to the discovery of DNA and RNA. DNA is important for our cells to grow and make new ones, and it also contains our genetic information. In turn, RNA is a copy of DNA, also called transcript, and it is responsible for all the work in our cells guided by DNA information. This discovery led to toxicogenomics, in which multiomics techniques are applied to toxicological analysis, evaluating alterations in genes and transcripts via genomics and transcriptomics, proteins via proteomics, and metabolites via metabolomics, to provide a better insight into biological pathways affected by drugs. In this thesis, we used, we used omic techniques particularly transcriptomics, to investigate drug-induced intestinal toxicity. But why the intestines? While the small and large intestines are important not only for the absorption and metabolism of nutrients and drugs, but also as a defensive barrier against infections or harmful compounds. Due to their vital role, intestinal injury caused by adverse drug reactions has become a big concern among doctors, because intestinal toxicity can lead to intestinal complaints or diarrhea, which complicate the treatment of diseases, such as cancer. Current diagnosis or monitoring of intestinal toxicity is very limited. Therefore, genetic biomarkers that better predict intestinal toxicity are needed. However, compared to other organs, only few studies have investigated drug-induced intestinal toxicity. To learn about this, we established 3D cultures of organoids derived from human tissue uh, of colon and small intestine due to their promising organ-like features, such as crypts and villi. For this study, the intestinal organoids were exposed to three different anti-cancer drugs, namely 5-fluorouracil, which I will present in more detail, doxorubicin and chafitinib, to investigate gene expression changes and affected cell processes. Furthermore, the organoid data was compared with data from colon tissue of patients treated with 5-FU. Finally, we tested the potential upgrade of the colon organoid model by combining with macrophages in a 3D co-culture to study inflammation-associated toxicity during exposure to drugs. Therefore, 
This work evaluated the potential of organoids derived from human tissue as a replacement to traditional cell cultures and animal testing. The new organoid gene data on intestinal toxicity aims at improving in vitro drug research and translation, as well as to reduce animal studies as they poorly reflect human responses. This work also aims at improving computational models in predicting intestinal toxicity. Another goal is to improve drug safety assessment so that adverse side effects are minimized and patients can have a better quality of life. Starting with chapter two, here we investigated 5-FU toxicity mechanisms in the organoids. We know that 5-FU acts by incorporating into DNA and RNA, as well as by inhibiting thymidylate synthase, a protein important for DNA synthesis. Other affected pathways are not fully investigated, which we learned via transcriptomics, metabolomics, and omic integration. The transcriptomic results show that 5-FU caused activation of DNA repair, P53 signaling, oxidative stress, and cell death, as well as inhibition of cell cycle, DNA synthesis, and ATP for energy production. In turn, the metabolomic results showed a decrease of the levels of energy products, and alterations on DNA synthesis and oxidative stress products in line with the transcriptomics. We also observe alterations in genes specific to colon and small intestine. As an example, this water transporter was only downregulated in colon, and a different water transporter was downregulated in the small intestine. Furthermore, we attempted at understanding how genes and metabolites are connected. After a combination of both, we found that transcription factor E2F1 was the best connecting point between genes and metabolites. In this study, 5-FU caused downregulation of E2F1, which in turn led to downregulation of cell cycle genes and favored the upregulation of cell death genes. In conclusion, we found that exposure to 5-FU caused uh, DNA damage and synthesis inhibition, inhibition of cell cycle progression, activation of cell death, and alterations in water transport, which can be linked to clinical findings of diarrhea. Next, Chapter 3 describes the transcriptomic data from colon tissue of patients treated with 5-FU and comparison with the colon organoids. The most affected pathways in the patients were the transport of molecules, cell responses to stress, and vitamin metabolism, which were also found in the organoids. In contrast, immune system responses were only affected in the patients. Interestingly, increase of the levels of TRIM31 was found in the patients and in the colon organoids. This gene represents an important intestinal protein. In conclusion, we found that patients treated with 5-FU showed alterations in the transport of molecules and water, which can be linked to diarrhea, inflammatory responses, which can be secondary effects due to colon cell damage, and also some similarities between the organoid model and patient's tissue, namely TRIM31, which may be a promising biomarker of colon toxicity. Briefly, Chapter 4 focused on doxorubicin toxicity mechanisms in the organoids. We know that doxorubicin inhibits DNA and RNA synthesis and also leads to the generation of radical oxygen species. Other affected pathways are again not fully investigated, which we did via transcriptomics and proteomics. We found that exposure to doxorubicin 
uh, he inhibited cell cycle and activated cell stress and cell senescence. Gene responses specific to colon and SI was also observed. And an example are the upregulation of this lipid transporter only in colon, and the downregulation of this glucose transporter only in the small intestine. Similarly, in chapter five, the mechanisms of toxicity of gefitinib were investigated. We know that gefitinib inhibits the epithermal growth factor receptor by blocking the binding of ATP. Other affected pathways are not fully understood, which we learned via transcriptomics. We found that exposure to gefitinib caused activation of cell death, decrease in cell adhesion, and alterations on cholesterol metabolism. This is linked to the tissue-specific response we observed, namely the upregulation of this gene in colon, which seems to be linked to downregulation of cholesterol synthesis, whereas in SI we found the opposite. Finally, in chapter six, we combined colon organoids and macrophages, establishing a co-culture. We tested the co-culture by exposing it to a bacteria molecule called LPS and by the drugs doxorubicin and doxorubicin with ibuprofen. Then we measured the levels of inflammatory agents such as TNF-alpha. In the co-culture, the levels of TNF-alpha were increased after exposure to LPS and doxorubicin and by adding ibuprofen, the levels of TNF-alpha decreased. In the macrophages alone, the levels of TNF-alpha were also increased with LPS, but they did not change with doxorubicin or ibuprofen. In the colon organoids alone, the levels of TNF-alpha did not change with any of the exposures. Therefore, we concluded that we established a successful interaction between the cell types in response to chemical exposures. As concluding remarks, this work attempted at better understanding which biological pathways are affected by different drugs, since data available on intestinal toxicity is very limited. To accomplish this, human 3D organoids were exposed to three different anti-cancer drugs. We observed differences in the drug responses, mainly regarding the transport of molecules, uh, signaling pathways, cell death, cell adhesion, and metabolism. Furthermore, each drug significantly affected different genes, as well as tissue-specific genes. Despite the different mechanisms, the different drugs cause perturbations in cell cycle and activation of P53 signaling pathway. Therefore, different mechanisms of toxicity affected cell growth, cell proliferation, and differentiation, culminating in intestinal injury, which ultimately could lead to diarrhea. Regarding the scientific impact of this thesis, it brought innovative in vitro models to study drug-induced intestinal toxicity uh, as alternatives to uh, traditional cell cultures or animal testing. It also generated um, new data, particularly on transcriptomic drug signatures, so that gene markers to prevent adverse effects were identified. This could also contribute to the future development of safer medicines. Last but not least, our data is being included into computational models to improve intestinal uh, toxicity and its prediction caused by different drugs. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass the word to the prorector. Thank you, Mrs. Rodriguez, for this clear presentation of your summary of your thesis. The opposition will be uh, opened by the chair of the thesis assessment committee, 
Professor Jonkers. She is Professor of Intestinal Health at Maastricht University. Professor Jonkers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team with really a very nice uh, thesis. I really did appreciate uh, reading it. And I also the very nice, um, yeah, complex uh, and integrated work you, you, you did using a nice model together with several omics approaches. And you may not be surprised that I'm very interested in the organoid uh, model. You may have uh, found that uh, uh, also. So uh, you concluded also that your model is very uh, important, innovative to study intestinal injury, uh, drug related. And, uh, but for that, we of course need a very robust model and also one which is representative of what is happening in vivo. And that's what I would like to discuss a bit further with you. And maybe further to start with the robustness of the model, because I did some organoid cultures myself, you may know that. So I uh, we had the experience that if passing those organoids, the phenotype T uh, uh, typical appearance may may differ. Uh, so, what is how robust is your model in that context? If you use different passages of, because you have one cell line that you use for your organoids, so how robust are the findings if you do them now and if you repeat them, you know, with a passage ten times later or so? Uh, uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments uh, and for your question. Um, yeah, so these, uh, of course, the the organ rates uh, model is still very, uh, very recent. Um, but uh, yeah, the organ rates that uh, we have, uh, of course, they are from different donors. Um, so I believe that we also um, selected uh, differential expressed genes that we believe could be reproducible to uh, other organoids because they are um, associated with the drug toxicity and also with um, the function of colon cells or small intestine cells such as the membrane transporters of, of um, aquapurins or other. And, and did you repeat your things? experiments maybe with, uh, with an organoid, with, with organoids from a few passages later? Did it make a difference or did you check that out of uh, curiosity? No, I did not. Uh, of course, that would be the next step to gather um, or to isolate um, cells from different donors, from different patients, and um, yeah, culture them and see where is their response. Because of course, when we're talking about gene expression changes, you have to also take into account the genetic background of everyone. So every patient has a different reaction, yeah. a different response, so that would be yeah, we would have to okay. do a bigger uh, study to uh, actually incorporate yeah. everything. Yeah. So that would do that. That a part of the future perspectives. Maybe going back to your organoid model because I'm very was very interested in the fact that you use both colon and in small intestinal organoids. Mm -hmm. You also showed that it's also nice that you mentioned the villas and and uh, the crypt uh, there. Uh, but I was also a, a bit. Uh, yeah, uh, surprised that the colon organoids were yeah, way more sensitive mm -hmm. than the small intestinal organoids. If you look to the tight junctions, for example, we know that they are more tight in the colon. So what is your explanation that for these differential findings? Um, I think uh, one of the reasons could be that, um, yeah, the small intestine and the colon, they do have different metabolic activities. Uh, so it could be that the small intestine um, can find uh, other uh, resistant or survival mechanisms that in the colon not exist, or the metabolizing of the drug itself into less toxic um, metabolites that in the colon does not happen. And could also be because um, yeah, the colon and the small intestine, they are derived from different donors, so that could be also one of the reasons that the donor who provided for the colon organoids um, also has a, is more sensitive, let's okay. say, to the, the drug exposure than yeah. the donor that, um, that the small inside derived, yeah. derived from. Uh, okay. So I think these are the two main possible reasons okay. why. why. And, and if I um, uh, uh, saw it correctly uh, in, the, in the medium you use for the small intestinal organoids, um, uh, then it looked probably more like a crypt-like small intestinal organoids. I don't know if you may know the 
publication of the colleagues from surgery who had either differentiation medium or growth medium and either had fillers or crypt-like organoids. Could it be that if you would establish uh, fillers-like organoids that you would have differential findings? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it could be that that would impact as well the, um, the results. Um, of course, the, the, med the growth media and the, the, the media that comes from the, the commercially available, um, yeah, they, I mean, I, th I believe that the, the main factors are there, but of course, when you, when you have your own media, it's different than when you have a commercial one. So that would, yeah. of course, uh, impact the results, um, I think, at some, in some extent. Yeah. Um, and then but both organoids were exposed the oh, same sorry. way, so sorry. <laughs> both organoids were exposed in the same uh, condition, so we have, like the growth media and then uh, changed to the, the commercial one, so that at least the exposures were in the same media. Yeah. Maybe a final short question, if I may. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, if you look to the, to the intestine, then we have the epithelial lining. Uh, you also described it nicely in your thesis. And then we also have, of course, not only the enterocytes, but also the goblet cells and enteroendocrine cells. Do you know if your model also represents the presence of these cell types? Uh, did you check that? Uh, I did not check myself, but um yeah, previous work with these organoids, they did check that um, indeed we had different types of cells that in vivo also uh, are present, such as stem cells, the panet cells, and yeah, enterocytes or colonocytes. <laughs> yeah, so you yeah. expect them to be uh, present? Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There. Okay, maybe, okay, I see that. Okay, then I'll, then I'll thank you very much for your answers and I give the floor back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jonkers. The opposition will be continued by Professor Pritchard. He is Professor of Gastroenterology at the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Professor Pritchard. Dear candidate, um, thank you. I enjoyed reading your thesis. It's very well written and contains a lot of data uh, and lots of, lots of analysis and lots of interesting work. Uh, I'm going to focus my questions on chapter six, your co-culture model. So I think you've shown in uh, chapter three that the responses in vivo in the patient were a bit different from the transcriptomic responses in the organoids, suggesting that the immune system has uh, an effect in regulating the toxicity of these drugs. And we also know that some drugs such as ibuprofen, are likely to work and cause dr uh, drug toxicity via immune cell activation rather than primarily by, by the epithelial cells. So you've made a start at trying to develop a more representative model combining epithelial and immune cell types. So the first question is about why you chose macrophages and why you chose the cell line that you did for macrophages rather than primary macrophages. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start with that first and then we'll, we'll develop from there. Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your compliments and uh, for your question. Um, yeah, the reason that I chose macrophages, uh, it's, well, first, because I think it's very um, innovative. Um, yeah, as far as I know, there aren't, uh, there aren't any cultures combining organoids and this, this kind of inflammatory cells. Um, and then my other reason to, for choosing macrophages um, was that during inflammatory response, um, usually you have um, the monocytes that are in the bloodstream, they migrate towards the, the, the gut, and then there they differentiate into macrophages, and then the inflammatory response um, is triggered. Um, and also in the colon, um, we have Re colonic residential macrophages are also important for uh, maintaining the, well, the, the healthy gut, let's say, and um, the homeostasis of the tissue. Um, so that's why I, I chose macrophages. I wanted to, to investigate further um, the, yeah, the influence of having these cells um, together with, with the colon organoids. So in the, in the results that you present in your thesis, you looked at doxorubicin in combination with ibuprofen, but I didn't see any data on ibuprofen alone. 
uh, as a control. Did, did that have an influence on any of the parameters that you measured, like the cytokine concentrations or, or anything? Uh, yeah, we did test it uh, ibuprofen alone, but we did see we didn't see any okay. changes at all. Um, so it was if as nothing was there. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's why we just didn't pursue it further. Okay. So if you were going to develop such a co-culture model, what other cell types do you think it would be interesting to combine? Do you think it's do you think you can only combine one immune cell type and the epithelial cells at a time, or do you think you might eventually get to be able to put in lots of different immune cell types? So speculating into the future, how mm -hmm. do you think this model could be developed, and how would you like to do it if you had the opportunity? Uh, yes, I think the future of these school cultures is to have um, as much as complexity as our own um, human tissue, let's say. Uh, so, of course, apart from the macrophages, you would have to have, for instance, B cells because they are also important when you have inflammatory response. And in the case of the colon or the small intestine, uh, to have a good co-culture, I think the microbiome would also be important because the microbiome also has an impact on drug metabolism and um, yeah, responses to, to the drug. Um, so, I think like, well, having this very complex co culture, uh, we would have a better representation of our own um, uh, gut. So, if you had one cell type you could choose next to look at after a macrophage, what would be the, the, uh, the next immune cell type that you think you would like to try? Um, the next immune cell, um, maybe uh, B cells, because they are also uh, very important during inflammation. Um, yeah, and then together with the macrophages to study how these, how the signaling events and how the inflammation cascade of events uh, actually happen, and how can, and if they, if it is good or a bad thing, uh, yeah, if it's harmful or if it's actually protective to the epithelium. Um, so I think I would choose the B cells. And final question from me will be: so if if you're eventually aiming for completely representative in vitro model. You'd have the epithelial cells as your organoid, you'd have some immune cells. You're saying about having the microbiome or the microbiota. Are there any other components that you might want to include to have a, an ultimately representative model? Um, well, that's a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I think, well, just to have the micro environment of the, the gut itself, you also have the, the cells surrounding the, the, the intestinal epithelium. They're also important for, uh, to, yeah, to confer some protection to the, to the gut and also the way that the cells communicate with each other. Um, could be important also to have that information. Yeah, I mean, the, the myofibroblasts secrete a lot of yeah. wind signals and do a lot of the signals that affect differentiation. So yeah. I, think, I think those cell types ultimately will be, need to be in there as well. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. My time's Thank up. you. Mm. You still have some time for a small question. Ah, okay, I, I, will, I will defer for now. That's, that's, uh, that's enough on that topic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the uh, next opponent is uh, Professor Price. He is Associate Professor of... Um, uh, in vitro system for drugs design and safety at Leiden University, and he is also affiliated with uh, the company Crown Bioscience in Leiden. Uh, Professor Price. Thank you, Prorector. I'd like to congratulate you and also to your uh, promoters for uh, this excellent uh, thesis. I've enjoyed reading it, and uh, in particular, I appreciate the couple of things. Is one is the consistency of the approach that you've made throughout your chapters. I think it shows a sort of systematic approach, which I think is uh, to be uh, uh, valued in a toxicologist. Um, also, what I appreciate is that you've selected organoids as the, as the common theme of your thesis, and a lot of people uh, doing their research, they'll do a bit of organoid studies on the side, but you've made that central, which is something that uh, I've also <laughs> chosen to do, and I appreciate. I'd like to start off uh, with my first question, actually to follow on from uh, my esteemed colleague here. 
uh, about the um, complexity. You said um, ideally you would bring everything into the model, the, the fibroblasts and the immune cells and the microbiome, um, but I think you appreciate more than most that it's not easy working with organoids. They're complicated tissues to work with. Um, there aren't many publications on where there's been a co-culture with macrophages. And one of the reasons is, is it's actually rather difficult to do all those co-cultures. So perhaps bringing all of these different components together in an ideal world would be wonderful, but we're faced with the reality of having to have a robust, reproducible model to test our compounds. So I would agree with uh, my colleague here that perhaps choosing one cell type is the realistic way to go. You made a selection based perhaps on literature and gut feeling perhaps. <laughs> um, but what you've also made a comparison of patient tissue and organoids and looked at the gene expression changes in response to the therapeutics. So if you look specifically at the gene, exp compared the simple organoid, simple organoid model compared with the patient model, can you get insight into the additional pathways that are switched on in the tissues that might tell you which um, additional cells, in fact, you do need to have present? Mm -hmm. uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments uh, and for your question. Uh, uh, indeed, with the uh, human uh, study, uh, which we did, uh, well, one of the most affected pathways were the inflammatory responses, and one of them was actually um, B differentiation, B cells differentiation, and um, signaling events to, uh, let's say, call the B, the, the, the B cells. That's why um, I thought of this type of cells as the next step to, to do the, um, the co culture instead of macrophages or together with the macrophages. Of course, it adds complexity to, to it. And yeah, the analyses are going to be also more challenging. But uh, um, I think that's one of the goals is to, yeah, to um, to address it. And do your um, gene expression analyses indicate that there's actually a crosstalk between the B cells and the uh, enterocytes, or do you think that these are just independent um, responses to the uh, treatments? Um, I don't think they are independent uh, because we did, um, yeah, the gene expression analysis was with the colon, uh, colon cells. So the gene, the genes that stood out with regards to B cell differentiation or um, signal events, they come from, well, the, the colonocytes um, that trigger this kind of um, signal event um, that has brought the cells, the B cells, to the tissue and made them uh, differentiate so that they can have, um, they can build, let's say, a, a response due to the, well, the damage or the, or the presence of the of the drug in the epithelium. Perhaps it's difficult to say unless you do a study like you did, nicely showed with the co uh, the co culture with the macrophages, where you really need to look with and without and see whether the crosstalk is. Sorry, can you repeat again? Well, you 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 showed in um, in chapter six, I think that there's a in the co-culture with the macrophages that there's in fact a crosstalk. Uh, perhaps you would need to do the same thing with B cells to yes to actually to prove that um, yeah I that, would that, that there would be an interaction. Yeah. But thanks for your uh, thank you for your um, response. I want to dive into the weeds a little bit and draw your attention to uh, some results in chapter five on a page 143. Um, you show the responses in, uh, to uh, viability and caspase activation, so cell death, in small intestine and colon. And you show that, uh, there's a, uh, that in colon there's quite some resistance um, in terms of cell death, but there's um, more of a, sorry, in terms of proliferation, viability, uh, but they're somewhat more responsive um, in terms of cell death. Um, in the caspase uh, figure, which is figure B, um, on, of figure 3B, you show that there's um, a 600% increase in 
caspase activity, which sounds very profound. Mm -hmm. um, and you say that there's a that this is a significant activation. Do you mean statistically significant or biologically significant? Uh, I mean uh, statistically significant. So yeah. would that mean it's not biologically significant? Sorry, it's not. Would what? that mean that it's not biologically significant? Um, yeah, it is also biological significant, but then um, here it's yeah I would say it's statistically, and then uh, after we actually did the transcriptomics, I would then say if it's biologically or not. I mean, if you um, you know if your basal cell death is half a percent, then a six hundred percent increase would take you up to 3% cell death, which you might not say is sig particularly biologically significant, but if it was 10% basal and you had a 600% increase, then you would have a 60% cell death, which would be quite profound. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, you, you've used another method to address this, which I think is on the next figure, using the imaging um, in figure 4E. where you have an experiment where you show the effect of gefitinib on organoid cell death, where it goes up to actually 80 or so percent. Mm -hmm. So would you say that that was biologically significant? Um, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, um, the obviously the, well, the, the Caspase 37, um, uh, let's say parameter or um, how do you say um, kit <laughs> uh, a, re re a reagent um, yeah it's it's not always uh, heterogeneous but uh, uh, I think the image um, analysis is in this sense um, better at representing the um, self death uh, significance in the organoids rather than the caspase uh, so these analyses are just, um, let's say, a guidance to, to us to see what is happening with the, with the cells. Um, so the, image, the imaging here of the, the cell death is, let's say, more relevant um, than the, um, the caspase. Good, thank you. Uh, would you say that that response is an off-target response or an on-target response, the, uh, the effect in the colon organoids? Sorry again. Would you say that the response is an off-target, the death is an off-target effect or an on-target effect? And briefly say how you might. Uh, I that. think it's still on target because it's still associated um, or it's still linked to the to the to the inhibition of the the um, epithermal growth factor receptor, and then um, yeah, by blocking this this receptor, all the cascades that follow are also. Um, impaired, uh, that leads to um, inhibition of cell cycle and activation of P53 and therefore also uh, apoptotic events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Price. The next opponent is uh, Professor Lechler. She is Professor of Toxicology at uh, Utrecht University. Professor Lechler. Thank you. Dear candidates, um, my congratulations as well for this extensive amount of work that you have done here in this thesis. It's very interesting work um, characterizing the transcriptome of these novel organoids, so very impressive. Um, I also wanted to extend my congratulations to your promoter and your co-promoter and all of your colleagues here today because I, I know an achievement like this is certainly a, a team effort. So when I received your, your thesis, and thank you for sending it to my home address, that was very kind of you. I, I was very, uh, very, I, I loved the title. Um, I, I looked at, uh, at gut feelings and I started to, to laugh and I showed it to my husband and I thought, oh, these intestinal organoids, they must have emotions, you know, they must have some sort of feelings. But of course, this is a, a play on words, right? The gut feelings. And a gut feeling, I, I, I looked it up, you know, a gut feeling is, um, a term that you describe when you talk about um, something that is a flash of insight that you get, right? A flash of insight from deep within you. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it makes you have a tummy ache or butterflies in your stomach. Or it's coming from somewhere else in your brain, actually, than your rational, uh, scientific, linear way of thinking. 
generally. So I was really interested, is this, is this just a, a, you know, a play on words for you, or was there actually a remarkable insight that you had in your thesis that you would like to share with us? Maybe it's not coming from your linear or rational part of your brain, but from somewhere else, from your gut? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, compliments and for this lovely question. Um, yeah, well, I have two sides, uh, well, there's two sides of the, um, of the story regarding with gut feelings. Uh, well, one of them is, yeah, of course, the gut feelings, the uh, regard more related to the work, uh, especially if you think about um, patients, because this work is to improve um, the patient's treatment. Uh, so in order to minimize these bad gut feelings that they, they have, like uh, intestinal complaints and diarrhea. Uh, so that's one of the meanings of these gut feelings. And the other meaning is more personal in the sense that um, for me as a, throughout my PhD as a scientist, uh, sometimes you have to go with your gut feelings uh, when you, yeah, when you have to do an experiment or um, a decision uh, or solving a problem. So um, yeah, so this is more of about me, <laughs> about my gut feelings in, uh, during Can you uh, give us work. an example of a gut feeling that you followed that led you actually to a new a new discovery. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, sometimes is um, when you're still doubtful or you don't really know where to go <laughs> or uh, what kind of, um, yeah, when you have a problem and uh, especially, and you, you struggle to find the way out. Uh, yeah, sometimes you just go with your gut feelings and see what happens. If it goes the wrong way, then you <laughs> choose another way, and yeah. So that's which, which uh, that explains was it. <laughs> explains that one um, proposition, right? Uh, about I've dis I've successfully discovered ten thousand things that don't work. I, I really like th that one as well from Thomas Edison. Uh, thank you. So I, I I'll move on to the more serious questions then. I was really curious if. If at one point you had a feeling about something that made you change your direction of your research or, or something. But let's move to uh, another question I had for you. I wanted to ask you, um, I was also very um, pleased well, to, to see that, that you started your introduction actually with a little bit of background in toxicology. Um, because of course this is, this is a very applied Fundamental, fundamental unapplied part of toxicology that you've done in this work, but you started with a more general background into the history of toxicology, and you, you started to, to talk about Paracelsus and the importance of dose-response relationships, and I noticed you mentioned dose-response relationships in your presentation as well. Um, but from my feeling, you don't really come back to the dose-response relationships in your thesis. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, when I look at all your data um, and your tables of differentially expressed genes in different pathways, you know, is there actually, can you speak of dose response relationships? So perhaps we could take a, take a look at an example. Um, page 147, uh, where you look at the um, most relevant on target pathways perturbed by, um, oh, by that drug. I don't know how to say that exactly. Um, and you, you show here on this table two, you know, lots of different pathways. Uh, you looked at different time points and you looked at different concentrations that you exposed your organites to and you, you get different differentially uh, expressed genes. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, are these examples of dose response relationships? Um, I think these work or these differential expressed genes um, they can be related with those response relationships because it's, or these genes will reflect the, um, the response that, um, well, in this case, organoids, but in the future, maybe patients, uh, will have towards the, the, the therapy. So um, it could be that uh, for one particular patient, um, these genes are not even affected. So it means that his response to the, the treatment is okay, so it doesn't have to be adjusted or interrupted at all. But for more sensitive patients um, that respond, um, let's say, not so well to, to, to the treatment, 
and they do they did find uh, they do find alterations in in the genes. Uh, it means that um, they suffer from, from more more toxicity to the to the treatments, and it means that uh, for these patients they have to have a different kind of uh, dosing uh, to start with. So then, um, let's say these responses, this toxicity can be um, minimized. So I think that's how my work relates with these those uh, those those response relationship. Can, can can you say from this data that the the higher the concentration or the dose, um, the higher the dose, the, the the higher the number of differentially expressed genes? So, for example, in the first block of genes there under the reactome, you don't see anything happening until 72 hours, and then you see the higher the concentration, the the more differentially expressed genes, or or the the significant pathways of gene, the genes expressed in that pathway. Can you say that? Is, is there a linear dose-response relationship? You may give a short answer, please. Uh, okay, <laughs> I will try. <laughs> um, well, in these cases, well, when you have different time, there's more of a time-response relationship rather than dose, um, which I think, uh, well, the dose-response relationships in toxicology was an important concept. Um, in the first types of toxicology, but now we also have to consider not only the dose, but also the time that, well, the exposure happens, or uh, also the time that the patients have their therapies. So the therapies are not just for one day, it's for um, two weeks, a month, so I think you also need to uh, consider the, the, the duration of, of the exposures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lechler. The opposition will be continued by Professor Evelo. He is Professor of Bioinformatics for Int Integrative Systems Biology at Maastricht University. Professor Evelo. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, let me start with complimenting you and, and for real. I mean, this is great work in the sense that you combined a lot of things that are actually each of them awfully hard. Right? So this is the kind of generalist approaches that we typically miss nowadays. Right, you, start, you actually develop the co-culture system, you approach that using omics technology, you don't forget to actually use a microscope too, and, and then it just in passing you do some kinetics work using PBPK modeling where other people write a whole thesis on just that part and it's just a few lines in this one. Right, I think that's great. Um, but I want to challenge you on what it really means. So if you go through to the omics outcome and you look at the pathways, and I look at the pathways and I can just tell you from my head, right? You see effects on the cell cycle, you see effects on metabolism, you see effects on oxidative stress, you see effects on inflammation, and, and finally you see apoptosis if you wait long enough. I can tell you something that always happens in every biological study you do, not just in toxicological studies. As soon as something in the tissue changes, that is what happens. Mm -hmm. So I want to know whether you agree that in that sense, you're basically using transcriptomics as a very expensive microscope. And then I would like to discuss with you how we could improve that. <laughs> uh, highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your compliments and for your challenging question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that um, my work, uh, yeah, it's, it involves a lot of expensive, uh, indeed, um, techniques. Uh, so that's why um, our goal was to also um, generate um, these, the data that is missing out there. So then future work can be, um, can use these this data to further explore um, the intestinal toxicity caused by different drugs. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, um, what can I say? Um, yeah, also um, the development of the intestinal organoids um, offers um, new in vitro models that people can, uh, can use in the future um, 
perhaps even help in standardizing the protocols uh, so that the work is also smoother and more reproducible between, between people. Um, so I think, yeah, this work uh, could contribute to uh, the future of in vitro drug toxicity um, with uh, yeah, the data, the gene expressions that changes that we also found. Uh, could be a starting point as well for um, future work with different drugs, for instance. I fully agree, yeah. but let, let's try to pinpoint it a bit more. I, if if you, you already in your thesis mentioned that the time yeah. effect is very important, so I don't want to go there, but that is, of course, it's really important because the late effects are these more general effects that you in the end see. Um, now, one of the things you do is actually you do a Bonferroni correction, right? So you start with a lot of genes that are marginally changed, and then you do that Bonferroni correction to get rid of the ones that aren't definitely, significantly, statistically changed, but actually you do a pathway con evaluation next. So wouldn't you kind of expect that if you did not do the Bonferroni correction and just looked at the genes that m seem to change, but not, or might not all of them, they might actually end up in the same but relevant processes? Uh, sorry again, <laughs> maybe rephrase it. It's a bit of the child in the bath water, right? I mean, yeah, if you do a yeah. Monferroni correction, yes, you will get rid of a lot of false positives, but you will lose a number of real positives too. Mm -hmm. So what is more important here? Um, I think the, the most important is the transcriptomic part, the gene expression changes, because they are, um, let's say, the first cell response to an exposure. So they are the, the, the first process that are, is altered after a drug exposure um, that you can um, identify first uh, because all the other changes, the, 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 the phenotypic changes, they can come later when the, the, gene, well, the genes are already uh, altered. Uh, so if you can identify this first mechanism, the, the gene expression changes and um, work in a sense to avoid those gene expression changes, then all the, the, the changes, alterations that come afterwards, like uh, protein changes or in the metabolites or in the phenotypic um, endpoints can be um, avoid as well. So um, I think, yeah, the transcriptomics is the better which representation. Which works, but it's basically using the microscope even more, right? Yeah, also, well, the, <laughs> the microscope, uh, yeah, of course, the microscope um, also helps identifying, um, you clearly see if a cell is uh, changed or not, or if it's dying or not, especially the organoids, you can do, definitely see if there's um, a damage, the, the, the cell stops uh, growing and actually loses the differentiated uh, status. Uh, so it loses the budding and becomes round, so you can easily uh, observe that in the microscope as well. There's yeah. a lot more I would like to ask, but I don't think we have time for that. <laughs> yeah, okay, are, are you aware of the developments that actually happened in the TransQST project as well, where you work, where, in which you yeah. work, where people looked at co-expression as it occurs in toxicological processes early on, and would that maybe help to find more specific effects in what you were doing? Uh, short, yeah, short answer, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, in the TransQST, we have the tools available to make these um, connections, and they they are currently working uh, for it to generate yeah, a model that predicts, well, other responses from the cells. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Give mm -hmm. the word back to the project. Thank you, Professor Evelo. The opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Penders, he is Associate Professor of Microbiology at Maastricht University. Professor Penders. Thank you, Mr. Prorenka. Uh, dear candidate, I would also like to, to congratulate you and, and your supervision team. And I think all the compliments have already been said how unique it is to do both these state-of-the-art in vivo models, uh, in vitro models, as well as generating these omics data, as well as integrating these complex omics data. So I think that's, that's a major achievement, uh, so compliments for that. Um, of course, I also have some questions uh, that I would like to ask. And first of all, I would like to ask one of your paronyms, 
to read out uh, proposition number seven. Proposition number seven, colon and small intestine show distinct drug-induced responses and gene expression changes, which from a clinical perspective can contribute to the improvement of precision medicine. Thank you. So when you talk about the application of, of these models for precision medicine, that, that would be a major leap forward, right? Um, and, and what you want to do is try to explain some of the inter-individual variation in, in response or in toxicity. Now, thinking about that and, and thinking about everything that you have said already in, in previous discussions, what would be, in your opinion, the major factor that would uh, influence the uh, inter-individual variation in mainly the drug metabolism? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments uh, and for your question. Um, I think, um, yeah, due to, of course, um, our work could um, um, improve precision medicine in the sense that we have, um, we, we try to, we investigate the gene expression uh, changes uh, specific to um, each drug. And um, yeah, and then, like I said in, before, uh, we, started with these organoids and in the future would be good to actually have um, yeah a certain for uh, for instance uh, patients and actually um, generate organoids from those patients uh, to uh, look into how each patient uh, responds to the treatment and how the organoids derived from that patient also responds to the same treatment um, and see if the, the gene uh, expression changes match or um, if the organoids are replicating what is happening uh, in the patient's yeah, colon. Maybe, maybe to st stop there, I, I agree. So you need uh, organoids from, from, from yeah. the in individual patients. But you also mentioned in, in, in some of the answers previously that, that one of the missing parts now is the microbiome and that it also plays a big role in drug metabolism. Mm. Um, and I think it's quite brave that you said, okay, we should also include the microbiome. But I was wondering what, what kind of hurdles do you see um, before that can be implemented? So do you have any suggestions for that? Uh, I think the challenge, uh, of course, it would be um, an innovation to add the microbiome to the organoids, but it's still challenging in the sense that um, also the microbiome itself, itself it's... Um, it varies among individuals. So to actually uh, select which strains and uh, the, yeah, the, um, yeah, the diversity you want to include, uh, it's a challenge itself because then you also have to have d different uh, organoids, like co-cultures specific to each patient, which complicates even more. Um, because of course, if you have a strain that actually um, metabolites, for instance, toxorubicin into less toxic uh, metabolites in one patient, then that patient probably will ha won't have such a such high risks for toxicity. But then, if this set strain is is not present in another patient, that um, then the, probably this patient will have more toxicity. So of course it's challenged in that sense. And, fr and from um, a technical point of view, because I, there is a lot of variation, yeah. is it easy to just throw in microbiomes or? or um, well, one of the techniques that I've, I've read to add the microbiome to organoids is the microinjection of, uh, yeah, of a strain or different strains uh, directly in, into the lumen. Um, so that would be also the technique I would I would use because it's also the the most used, let's say. Um, so, so in uh, your yeah. in your culture medium, can, can you is there antibiotics in there to prevent contamination, or don't you use antibiotics? Uh, yeah, I think uh, of course you would have to use some antibiotics in case of. Yeah, contamination because that, if, that would be if, even if the microbiome is not really in the into the lumen and goes out then <laughs> it would be a problem yeah okay mm -hmm. and, and and would there be another so the microbiome you already 
brought up sufficient challenges to make me really uh, doubt whether it's it's uh, suitable in, in, in uh, just a few years. But could you, you, you mentioned in the introduction that uh, another drug, even as a come, uh, was one of the drugs that is really influenced by the microbiome, right? So it's uh, inactivated in the liver, secreted in the lumen, and then there are uh, microbial enzymes that can reactivate it again by deconjugation. Now, knowing that these bacterial enzymes play a role, would there be another way to take in the microbial uh, role without uh, really having to include viable microorganisms, you think? Um, as far as, well, uh, as far as I know, well, you could also, uh, instead of uh, combining both this way in the lumen directly, you could also um, establish a <coughs> Mrs. Rodriguez, as you see, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss your, the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense, and please await our return with the results of our deliberation. Yeah, thank you. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their gym semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amount of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project. That includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. 
This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get used to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while. Who are we as a UM community? We are a group of people who love, talk, live, learn, work and think in a variety of ways. And we all want to be a valuable and valued member of our UM community. A community where everyone can feel safe, needs nurturing. To bring a community to its full potential, we all have a role to play. Every single one of us needs to be part of a moving conversation. To understand each other. To find help if you need it. Or to give help when asked. To connect with your peers and share some stories. And have some fun at the same time. Make space for new perspectives and broaden your horizon. Discuss. We don't have to agree, but we can learn. That diverse views are at the basis of our understanding. And including these views are the basics of a healthy community. Make a difference at your own pace. Join one of our active groups or become an ally. The first steps are not always easy, but let's help each other on this journey. Do you want to know more? Follow the UM's Diversity and Inclusivity Office on social media. Or well, check out maastrichtuniversity.nl forward slash diversity.
Mrs. Daniela Rodriguez. The committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor de Kok is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom and law. May I invite your supervisor to take the floor? Professor de Kok. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful, honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority invested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you Daniela Ferreira Garcia Rodriguez, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached to it by custom and law. As an evidence of this, I now present you the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. This takes a while. Dear Dr. Rodriguez, dear Daniela, it's a privilege to be the first one to address you in this way and to congratulate you. And like all PhD trajectories, uh, you have come a long way to stand here today and defend it. Uh, but then it is the coronation of many years of hard work that are brought you here today at this place. And I also congratulate your friend Greg and your family and everyone that has supported you in this uh, in this uh, in this trajectory, uh, either from a distance, your family at home, or from nearby, your parents and all other people. Um, going a long way back means that I also remember still the first meeting that we had, uh, searching for this candidate in the TransQST project. And what I remember is that you're very timid, which you still are. Um, that you were smiling, which you still are. And that you were modest, which you still are. But you've also grown and you have advanced in many different ways and I will get back to that later. Um, but you were also eager to come here to Maastricht uh, to advance your career. Uh, which I found uh, intriguing because you left quite a lot behind you, uh, such as your family, a, a, a boyfriend, uh, the lovely city of Porto, which I, uh, which I know a little bit, and sunny beaches. So I was wondering why leave that all behind and come here to Maastricht. So my first hypothesis was maybe it's for sake of science. Um, that's just a hypothesis. So your TransQC project was a large consortium with a strange combination of pharmacists, experimental biologists, clinicians and modelers that would use your data to build these predictive models for dr safer drug design. Um, and to be honest, in the beginning that was quite a struggle to get accommodated in this, to, to find your place, to get things moving. Um, so. In that sense, we really, after one year, had to consider what do we do. But I also noticed that you were a good writer. And to be honest, I actually at some point thought, she's just copy-pasting, but you weren't. This was you. And uh, so I, you know, I had this gut feeling it will work. Huh? So gut feeling being a theme, I think that was actually what we felt already at that time, although we didn't figure out the title of the thesis yet. Um, and then really soon in this first year, uh, you got this human organoid model working that previously didn't work. And then 
together with Teresinha, you picked up on the bioinformatics part and you got that also working. And then you got more confident and you took ownership of the whole project, which made all the difference in order to advance. And the biggest challenge was, of course, the human study. And the human study, I w uh, yeah, uh, which included these patients receiving capacity bin, we had to go on the on-go surgery for that as well. And um, I'm very happy that Mark Pritchard, who's here, was not really criticizing this approach, but he made it absolutely clear that this was really a challenge and he questioned very politely, because he's from the UK, the feasibility of this approach. And what happened next was COVID struck. And I have some gut feelings that he knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Uh, because the feasibility was the big challenge here indeed. So inclusion stopped with every lockdown and in between people were reluctant to come to the clinic and that's uh, why the study never really came to full uh, speed as we would have liked to see it, which would have been really, really added value. And what happened? The good writer, Daniela, made a chapter out of this. The chapter has been submitted and we're currently doing some final PCR checks in order to get it published as well. Like the three other papers that you just pushed into this really good journal with relatively little critiques from reviewers, making your thesis being almost completely published. Now that's, uh, the I think that is really, uh, really uh, an achievement. Now, the next thing I'm going to say, I maybe shouldn't, but you're also a bit of a, of a mystery that is difficult to resolve. Um, I don't know if I really know you. Uh, I think I do, but there's a... Uh, so I already mentioned the mystery uh, of why you came to Maastricht. And so science could be one, but I have some alternative hypotheses, as scientists do. So I thought, well, maybe it's all the nice ceramic tiles you see all over the, the facades in Porto that make, you, that make you think, if I go to Maastricht, where there is a history of ceramics industry, that would make you feel at home. Um, but to be honest, I don't think that the toilet bowls made by Sphinx are quite as elegant and quite unsuitable to decorate the city. Uh, so that makes it rather an incredible story. So the second alternative hypothesis is that the Servaas Bridge of Maastricht would make you feel at home in view of this nice Eiffel Bridge that you find in your hometown. Oh, fair enough to say that bridges always have something and bring people together, but also the comparison is, uh, and the compensation that that would bring is very, really weak. So there's only one alternative hypothesis left, and that is the famous Fado of Maastricht. Bebby Kraft, the queen of carnaval in Maastricht, outperforms the Fado of Porto. <laughs> Again, it's a hypothesis. Uh, so I challenge you tonight that you sing In the Himmel, the song In the Himmel, in Fado style. And if you refuse to do that, we will never solve this mystery and we will never know why you came to, uh, to Maastricht after all. <laughs> One final thing, uh, yet another mystery, which is the Daniela success factor. Because getting your PhD is, of course, a matter of your academic skills that you showed here today and your competencies. Uh, but what makes a person successful to immediately find a job after her uh, PhD defense? And not just a job, it's a job that suits your profile, a job that comes exactly at the right time, and exactly at the right place in Zurich, where Greg has also found his position. And that, that doesn't just happen, it's a kind of magic. So, also here I have my uh, hypothesis, which is the final one, and maybe it's just a gut feeling, but it could be that you're just genuinely a nice person. So you made a lot of friends here, some maybe even for life. You're always involved in activities of the department, which is appreciated, and you're engaged and endearing. So in other words, 
you are the ideal colleague that we hate to let go of, but whom we love to see move forward in her future life and career so that you can refine and perform your magic and mystery in the future. I wish you all the best with that. Thank you. Esteemed Dr. Rodriguez, dear Daniela, uh, it is my pleasure to be the second one to congratulate you with your doctorate, and I do that also on behalf of the uh, Board of Deans of Maastricht University. And maybe I may share some impressions from the committee about your thesis and your defense. Well, we have seen, to start with, a very clear presentation in which you step by step explain what you have done in your studies. Um, we have seen also a high quality thesis, well written, and it's also well published. In at least a number of, of chapters are published well in, uh, in, in good, good journals. Um, then your defense. We are satisfied with your defense, but well, we had some quite a lot of general questions, but also I think challenging questions. And you answered that correctly, but we would have liked to have some more details. But on the other hand, we are very aware of the complexity of the issues that you have studied. So altogether, we are very satisfied. And I would like to congratulate your two supervisors, uh, Professor de Kok and Dr. Jenne, uh, with this result that we have seen in, an, in, a, in a very good thesis and a very good defense. Congratulations with that. And of course, um, I include in my uh, congratulations um, your family and your boyfriend sitting here on the first row. Congratulations with your daughter um, and, and family member um, with the results that you have seen. Maybe you did not get all the issues in English, but I hope that you have seen that uh, we appreciate the, um, what your daughter has, uh, has obtained now. Um, I also include in my congratulations um, your, your colleagues and friends, of which I think that quite a number are here present in the aula. Congratulations, and also the two paranymphs. Um, and I would like to wish you a very successful professional career, and I, I have no doubts about its, its success and, and, and a happy personal life. And I'd like to thank all the members of this degree committee and the members of the thesis assessment committee. Uh, in particular, the, um, the external members, uh, because uh, we appreciate as, as a university your input in these committees um, very much. So thank you again very much for your efforts and your contributions. Um, before I close this ceremony, I have um, one um, thing to mention. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask you in the aula to leave uh, the aula and go to the reception, which is uh, outside, and you, if you follow uh, the Beatle, you will easily come there. And I would like to ask your, uh, your close family to be here because we are going to make a picture in the hall with you in the middle. And uh, so that's what we're going to do after this ceremony. And uh, we see each other again back at the uh, reception outside. I hope it's not too warm. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony. Maastricht University would like to extend warm congratulations to the PhD candidate and their supervisors on a successful PhD defense. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching.